Ryan Fisher, welcome to the Without Limits podcast. It's so good to have you here in Harpenden, all the way from Newport. Um, the last time I saw you was actually in Newport, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Dude, I'm actually hyped to be here because like, I get to see all the videos online. And obviously, like, we have similar brands, but like, mm. I just feel like it's just so cool to just like see to see anybody like in their own element that's like very similar to yours because there's not a lot of people like us out there, I feel like. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's why I was so drawn to you. And, and from that very first meeting that I had with you in, in Miami to where we are now, like we've, we've struck quite a friendship, but I yeah. think because we're on very similar paths, very similar, the way we are kind of outlook on life. Uh, our businesses are very, very similar in terms of the, the bricks and mortar and, and the online thing, which we'll dive into. So uh, I want to kick off with what does without limits mean to you? You're someone who evidently with everything you've achieved in your sporting career and in your business career, like you've had two very distinct careers that are both you know, really successful. We look at the the areas of life that you're competing in yeah bobsleigh crossfit very tough markets or very tough sports to, to get into and the online space as well very very difficult to break through all the noise so i think you you're someone that's that's very much had success in both of those so you clearly adopt a mindset of going out and getting after it and making something for yourself so yeah what does without limits mean to you this is a good one for me and i remember when i saw your brand and like thinking and and seeing how like that was like the main premise behind it, like the main mission of it and I always thought to myself, I was like, man, that is like something that I've always had in the back of my head, but I've never really like stated it the way that you say it. And I think whenever I think of without limits, this might not be exactly what you're ready to hear, but it's something that it, it's something that it sits in the back of my head all the time. And I always think about how I want everyone to be fit enough to be able to do anything at any point in time. And then what that actually means to me and keeps running back in my head is my mom. So my, my mom, like she smokes cigarettes and she's not like super fit. And she's only been on an airplane twice in her entire life. So that was to see me in California. But when she comes, like, I can't like bring her on a hike. I can't like do certain things with her. And it like really bothers me that I'm like, (sighs) like, there's so many things that I'm not going to get to do with my mom for the rest of her life because she's not ready. And like, in she's not always ready. You know Mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So I think about limit, I, I think about without limits. I think like always ready. I think about all these things and I want everyone to be fit. And like, for you, it's like, live without limits. And for me, it's just like, I just want fucking people to just be fitter than they are right now because the average person is not very fit. And I don't want anyone to have that kind of regret in their life where it's like, I won't be able to do stuff with my mom. I won't be able to do stuff with my kids or I won't be able to, like there's so many people who can't do stuff with their kids, with their parents, with all this stuff. And like, that's the kind of shit that like really bothers me. And that's what it means to me. That's power. I mean, you can see it rings through in everything you do. Like you've got this like, almost like unwavering energy that you bring to your social channels around trying to get people to, just feel a bit more positive about getting in shape and and going out and working out and you're making it so accessible. So yeah, I think your, your articulation of without limits and what it means to you, you can see that in in your daily actions, which I think is really powerful. And changes as you get older. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, we just spoke about it, right? Like now the, the, the endless struggle just to keep our fucking biceps big enough to fill our (laughs) t-shirts. Um, fill the sleeves. So like I said, you've had a pretty decorated, like, life in in the th- you're 37 right 37 yeah so you've done some cool shit so where did it all start you know i, I really i think your, your story into kind of crossfit and away from bob stays quite you know quite an exciting one for, for the listeners to hear um yeah you came from like nothing right so yeah, exactly. where did it all start for you and, and how did you get to where you are today yeah so I, I i would say like athletics and business are kind of like right next to each other now like in the way that everything kind of perspired to be where it is and it started with me actually being a gym attendant i was just like a little gym attendant, just like cleaning equipment. But I was on the Olympic uh, skeleton and bobsled development team. It's in Utah in in America. So it's like written like the middle Midwest of America. Um, So essentially, as I started training and, you know, I needed money to work, I got this job as a gym attendant. And while I'm attending the gym, there was this guy who was like always, he had like a group of people he was training with all the time. Like we had personal trainers in the gym and then we had this guy who just had a group. And they were always doing crazy things like sandbags and running around with like, you know, basically it was farmer carriers, but they were running around with kettlebells. And like, I would see people do these pull-ups like in circles and like all these different things. And I was like, what is going on over there? I'm like, this is the worst trainer I've ever seen in my life. (laughs) So then I I start hearing about this CrossFit thing and like this guy who's the trainer, he would always come up to me and say, hey, you should try this workout. You should try this workout. I'm like, dude, stop trying to get me to do this fucking stupid workout. Like, I'm like 208 pounds at the time, which is like 20, 25 pounds heavier than I am right now. And all I cared about was being as strong as absolutely possible. And and then one day he's like, you know what? I'll give you $500 if you can beat my time in this workout. Because he wanted me to do it so bad. I think he could see 
like the uh, the potential in me. Yeah. So he's like, it's it's twenty one fifteen nine thrusters and pull ups, which is Fran. And he's like, if you can beat my time, I'll give you five hundred dollars. And I was like, huh, that was interesting. And I did the workout, and I remember just eat is like immediately projectile vomiting everywhere. Like my my hands went backwards. Like I had all the signs of rhabdo. And then like I was like, I'm never doing that ever again. I got four and a half minutes on the workout. He got two o two, so that was what I was trying to beat. So then. Like a week went by and I was like, man, I really should try that again. And so I did it again and I got down to like 3.30. But again, projectile vomiting everywhere. Like I was like laying on the floor in the bathroom, just like so fucked up. And then I kind of just like kept, I was like, why do I, why do I like like this though? Like for some reason I like like it. And I'm like all fucked up for the whole day. I can't remember my name, like nothing, you know? And then um, eventually they kind of turned, that was Chris Spieler, by the way, for those of you who don't know. Um He's like one of the O O O G's of CrossFit mm. and like he's still in it and all of that. And essentially it kind of like went from there to me going to sign up for my first CrossFit gym. Uh, and the owner of that gym at the time was Tommy Hackenbrook, who was another really big CrossFit athlete. And I remember that my first time I walked in the gym, he just looked at me and was like, whoa, this guy looks athletic. Like I'm pretty pumped right now. And it was my intro class. And um, I remember he just was like, all right, let's see what you got. We're going to do like this workout. And it was like me and five other people who are our first time there. And uh, it was like, it was called baseline. It was 500 meter row, 40 air squats, 30 sit-ups, 20 push-ups, 10 pull-ups. And I remember going through it and I was like, so, so excited. And as soon as I got done, I was like, is the time good? Is the time good? And he's like, looks up at the board, like the record board. It's like his name. And I got like the same time as him. And he's like, would you ever think about competing? I was like, no, 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 no. I don't want to do that. I just like, I just like want to go to school and go to the Olympics for bobsled and skeleton and all that stuff. And he's like, I'll give you a membership for free if you just train when I train. And, and that's it. Cause I remember the price, I couldn't afford it at the time. And then I was like, okay, I just train with you and I get to come for free. And he's like, yeah. And I was like, okay. And then that was kind of how the whole CrossFit thing kind of started. And, um, I got into competing after that. And then, you know, the Olympics went by, I got injured, so I didn't get to actually go to the Olympic Games, but I was on the Olympic team the whole time training. And then from there, it, you know, I wanted to go into the military to go be like a Navy SEAL all the time. I got a special eye surgery. I had my helicopter pilot's license going in. I like was training, like all these different things. And then CrossFit just kind of was, it was something that didn't make me any money. It had mm -hmm. no future. It didn't support me at all. I knew if I was going to become a coach making $25 a class, I was completely fucked. But for some reason, I was like, I'm just going to keep doing this. I feel like if I love it enough, maybe something will happen. You know, everyone always tells you when you're growing up, like, the money will come. Like, don't worry about the money because if you love what you do, money will come, right? It's like mm. such a cliche thing. But at the time, I just believed that in the back of my head. And uh, I don't know, my, my mom always told me something too. She's like, I don't care if you ever work at McDonald's, just be the best person that works there. So I think about that and the money will come. So I'm like, everything I do, I'm just going to bring the best version of myself there. I want to bring all the energy. Like, I don't care how tired I am or how bad my day is. I'm just going to bring everything there. Like, I want to go fucking through the microphone right now mm -hmm. for people who are listening. You know, I want to be like, you ever want to get pumped? And uh, I think if you do that, I think that, you know, you really, nothing will ever really go wrong. So with a bit of perspective now, though, like looking back, what do you think kept you in CrossFit? Like, because you're right, the, the, the opportunity financially is, is pretty dark. Back then, is nowhere near it was now in terms of the eyes, the eyeballs on on CrossFit. So, with a bit of perspective, do you think it was the the feeling from the workouts, or perhaps more so, how accepted you were by that gym owner and the community and people to to try and get the best out of you? Which it sounds as though his intentions were not necessarily to to push him, you training with him to push him to be better, but more you training with him so that he could keep his eye on this this talent and maybe nurture him and push you. It was a little bit of both. Like he wanted someone to help him. Oh, was he still competitive at that time? He was he? competing at the time. He actually okay. he got second at the CrossFit Games that year. Oh, nice. Like, just it just got done, and then we're training for the next season. So my very first year in CrossFit, I went straight to regionals because I was, like, good enough right out the gate. Mm. I think I'd only been training for three months, and I wound up going to regionals. It was hilarious because I couldn't do, like, double unders, and I couldn't string together toes to bar, but, like, I would snatch, like, 300 pounds and then, like, and, like do all these crazy things uh, that no one else was doing at the time. I remember Rich Froning had just squatted 365 pounds and it was like a huge thing. Like everybody's like, holy fuck. And like at the time I did 365 for 20. And I was, and like, I remember like people were posting me everywhere. Like this guy is insane. And, um, that's kind of like my first video that went viral was I was doing 20 rep back squat program, which is like 
something that was really big at the time. And now I'm actually famous for that, like putting it in my, my programs. And I lost count at one point. I had like 345 pounds on the bar and I was like, fuck, I don't know how many I'm at now. Like I was like in so much pain. And I think I wound up doing like 27 reps instead of 20 because I was like, I'm just going to go to failure. And I'm in the gym and I'm barefoot. I have like nothing. I'm wor- I have literally have like no money at all. And I'm just like, you can just tell I'm like a homeless person. And then um, I like dropped the bar and I was like, I'm just going to post this on, on Facebook. And it just like went crazy. I was like, who is this person? <laughs> and that's kind of how I started getting like a social media following. Yeah, I, mean, I just wanted to touch on that. You were probably the first person. I mean, when I was kind of watching from a distance, I wasn't in CrossFit. Um, but I, I was a big fan of kind of watching it. You were the first person that brought a personality to it. Sometimes maybe for the wrong reasons, which you know wound you up in trouble. But at least you were like at least you were exciting to watch and, and polarizing, and, and it got you a bit of a followership. So, you, can we talk through kind of how you how you found your personality coming into something that was, you know, you were a bit of an outlier from that perspective? Yeah, I'm going to try not to get emotional there in this podcast, but. <laughs> It might happen at some point. So I think for me, um, you know, I grew up with like I had five brothers and sisters in my house. And then I didn't meet my dad really until I was 24. And then I met him. Well, like we we like didn't really agree that he was my dad until like this 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 recent year when I was 36. I'm 37 now. So I remember watching on. So like, yeah, it was like it was very recently. Um, he actually just texted me like like 30 minutes ago. But essentially, like, I didn't really like, know who my dad was like my whole life. And I felt that my whole life. Mm. And I didn't really like, I would talk to my mom about, like, me and my mom know, like, we, we talk about everything. Like, she knows, like, every, like, way too much. Like, <laughs> the first time I sleep with a girl, my mom wants to, like, know what it was like. Like, she's like, she's like, she wants to know everything. So we're, like, super, super tight there. But when I found social media, there was something about it to me where it was like, I don't really care to like, like, like I, like I, I don't feel very private. Like mm. I'll just say everything. I'll throw everything on there. My mom would get mad at me. She'd be like, Ryan, like you can't post that. And I'd be like, yeah, but like when I do, maybe like 20 people are like, dude, that was super fucked up. Why would you post that? Or like, or that was this, or that was that, or like that didn't fit in this box. That's going to make your brand better or whatever. I'd be like, I did it for me. Like I, like that's my therapy. I'd be like, I'm going to post this about this. Cause I like like somebody will give me some feedback and maybe a hundred people get offended, but like the one person gives me the feedback that I'm looking for. And it was like, I didn't really feel like I had that growing up. Like I just like was missing this element. I think maybe cause I didn't have my dad or whatever it was, but I like social media to me was kind of like my, like I tell people all the time in my Facebook group and like in my, in my chalk app, like you guys are like my legit family. Like for like, you guys are my family. Like you guys need to understand that. Like it's not a joke. Like it's not like I'm saying this to make you guys feel better. Like this is it. Like mm. you guys are it for sure. Like, that's all I care about. Like I've had multiple girlfriends and we get in big fights and I'm just like, no, no, no. Chalk will always win over everything. Like this is everything. Like I don't have tattoos, but if I did, it'd just be chalk everywhere on my body. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's fucking power. So, okay. So you come into CrossFit, you have this kind of like rise to, to the, to the regionals. Like, and for anyone that doesn't understand to get to CrossFit regionals, this day, like this day and age is next to impossible. Like I'm an averagely good athlete and I wouldn't even get 5% of the way towards regionals. Like you can't get out of uh, the open, particular, well, you can't get out of the open without all the skills. And you went to regionals without, you say double under the toaster bar. Yeah. Were you still doing strict pull-ups by that, at that stage? Or? No, I was doing you, everything. I was doing, I was doing all the things for sure. Cool. So you get to regionals and kind of where, where does it go from there? Because I think your CrossFit career was like, it was, it was fairly short, I think by, by all accounts, but. Uh, eight years. It was eight years. Yeah. Oh, sick. I okay. was regional seven times and. One of them, the only reason I didn't go is because I got suspended. You got in trouble. Year. Yeah, let's just, let's, just, let's just touch on that because I think that just closes the, the chapter of CrossFit quite nicely. Um, I mean, what, I, I guess just like, what was your experiences like over those eight years as, as an athlete? A, a lot of people that listen to this are, are, are aspiring athletes or have been in the athletic world. Like CrossFit is the, you know, the elite of the elite as it relate, relates to fitness. So what was your experience coming in from, from bobsleigh, not knowing all the skills, learning the skills, having, you know, eight visits to regional. So how, how was that process? I think what was really cool about CrossFit was when I first started, I was one of those people and maybe a lot of you guys listening right now, you're going to resonate with this, but like you get really fucking good at something. And then like a year goes by, you're like, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to do something else. Mm. And you get really good at that thing. And everyone's like, man, you should keep doing that thing. And you're like, no, I'm kind of over it. And then you do something else. And then like when I found CrossFit, it was like, oh, I got to be good at a lot of things. I, I think I'm going to like this for a while. So I liked that part of it because it made training so much more fun. Um, Also, when I was younger, 
I was like totally okay with like not making a lot of money and like totally okay with like not knowing, you know, what tomorrow was going to bring or like, I don't know. It was like, it's so much different. Like how you think about money and how you think about the future and everything is just so much different. But for me, it was like, this was everything to me and it was all that mattered. Um, and then thinking about the, the whole energy thing, like I'm kind of a weird energy person or it's just like, I think if you, if you have that energy, like I believe that everybody is watching at all times. I'm not a huge religious person, but like, I, I know that people always think like God is watching and all that. I think, I think that there's merit in that if that's what you believe in. But like, for me, I always just believe that like, there is something that is watching and people are always watching. And like, when you're ready to step up, the right person will be there to like, give you the, I don't know, like when you're playing like Mario, you know, and you like, you hit like one of those arrows and you go way faster. Mm -hmm. Like there's someone ready to 10 X you, you know what I mean? Like as soon as they know that you're the right person. Um, so I feel like when I was, when I was in it, I just always was like, you know, <laughs> things could be so much better, but I feel like I'm going to meet someone at some point in time that's going to make it way, way better. And at some point during this podcast, I'll tell you about my three people in my life that 10 X everything each time. Um, like pivotal points in my life where I met a person and it changed everything. Did any, any of those people come in whilst you were in your CrossFit career? Mm. Or towards, or towards the end? Uh, when I opened my gym. Yeah. Fine. We'll, we'll touch on that in a second. Yep. So from there, actually, um, I think the biggest thing was the variety in it the culture of it, the, like the family part that I really liked about it. Mm. And then in terms of competing, like you're saying to, to what I got in trouble and all that, I think the biggest thing was like, when you go to the competitions too, like, oh, man, it's just, there was something so cool about seeing the other people that you saw on Instagram and on social media. And now you're like with them, you know, and you're competing with those people. Like it seemed like movie stars, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it was like, wow, now I'm here with these people. Like, you know, it's like, it uh, it's just like, it's not the same anymore either. Like it's mm. not the same anymore. Like I, I remember when a gym that was 20, 30 minutes away, 10 minutes away, whatever, you were excited to go there and train with the athletes. And like, it was so, so fun. Now you're like terrified to go because you're like, are they going to take the members from my gym? Or, you know, we compete together in the same space and like all these different things. Like it's very, very strange. Like if you, if you throw an event in America and you invite all the other gyms, no one's going to go. But at the time, it was like everybody was there and everybody was hyped. And it was just like, oh, man. Like I always tell everybody now, I'm like, dude, CrossFit's not even nearly as cool as it used to be. Like it used to be so fucking cool. Like like Dogtown and the Z-Boys skateboarding movie, like shit was like that. Like it was so fucking cool. And now it's just like, you know, who's your sponsors? Like who's mm. – who's the, like what kind of shit do you guys do at the gym? How much money do your gym make? Like what kind of equipment do you have? And like all this stuff. I'm like, you guys ruined it. <laughs> <laughs> how did it um how did it leave so obviously you didn't do much of your bank balance how did it leave your your body i mean now i'm destroyed um, would you would you what would you have done differently from a from a, from a training standpoint because you do have to learn all of the skills you have to get super strong you have to get super fit the volume of training is very high like and i don't think it's just exclusive to crossfit that it leaves your body banged up like i came, came from rugby and I'm, I'm equally as banged up so mm -hmm. it's 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 certainly something that is very prevalent in a lot of sports particularly contact sports or high impact sports or sports where you have to try and build your body and, and train to a to a high output but would you have done anything differently from a training perspective yeah for sure um i think the biggest thing is the hard part for me is when i started crossfit i was like one of the ogs and nobody knew anything like there was no like these are the smart people. These are the people that do this. These are the people that do that in terms of methodologies. When I was going, it was just like rich running mentality. Do as much as absolutely possible so that you're always ready. And that that meant we're going in the gym today and doing a five rep max on something. And then later we're going to do a 50, uh, 50 minute Metcon. I've done 90 minute AMRAPs. I've done like crazy, 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 crazy things over and over and over and over again. And I always thought that no matter what I was doing, no matter how bad I felt or whatever, it was always going to be benefiting me in some way. Now I'd be like, bro, I'm just going to do strength training today. I'm just going to do skills on mm -hmm. this day. I'm just going to do hardcore conditioning on this day. And then certain days I'll mix some things together and, you know, different things that would increase my longevity in the sport and increase like, you know, or decrease the chance of overuse injuries and different things like that. Like I had multiple torn labrums in both shoulders. I had torn uh, meniscus and like cartilage and stuff in my knees on both, both, both mm -hmm. my knees too. I think if you have any injuries and you come into CrossFit and you keep doing these like repetitive movements over and over and over again at a high intensity, I feel like it highlights whatever you were fucked up in and now mm. you're super fucked up because of it. But I do have like, you know, there's certain parts of my body that you would assume would be more beat down and they're not too bad. I just, I then, it genuinely comes down to like the gym owner, how the workouts are being programmed or your own mindset. Like if you are training on your own 
in your own garage or in the open gym time at your gym, like what are you doing during that time? I think a lot of people are overdoing it all the time mm. <laughs> and they still are. Yeah. But yeah. I definitely would change my training a ton. Uh, yeah. We'll come on to training. So I think yeah, what you're best known for now with, with your performance is, is probably f- quite far removed from the CrossFit training you're doing there. Mm-hmm. Um, so your exit out of CrossFit, is this the first point in which you, you met this, this first like fairly influential person so up in the gym? The first person was, uh, and was it, was it a commercial decision? It was like, okay, I've been in this eight, eight years now and this like 10 X, supercharged thing financially isn't, isn't happening. I need to move on. Or was it a, was it a wind down of like your athletic potential? Cause like for me, it was certainly like I'd eat everything out of it. Like, it, like I could in rugby. And it's just a realization that I wasn't going to go to, you know, I wasn't going to be the, the superstar that I once probably thought I was. Um, and there was a whole kind of identity like shift and just realization that I had to go through it. What, what was it for you? I think for me, it was a mixture of I got in a lot of trouble at an event. I threatened to like murder a judge at an event. So it's just a, just a, I'll, I guess I'll, I'll summarize it for the listeners. But like essentially, I went into like one of my last regionals. I think I did two more after this, but it just like wasn't the same at that point. But I went into one and I was in an event where I knew I was going to win the event. It was like my event. It was the one event that I was looking for, looking forward to the entire weekend. And the guy just kept saying, no rep, no rep, no reps. Like every rep that I'm doing, they're not counting towards the score, which was 21, 15, 9 of box jumps and deadlifts. And what were they no repping you on? They said I was bouncing the bar. And it was the first year they ever had competition plates. We were all used to like the bouncy plates. Mm -hmm. And when they did this, like no one could bounce the bar really. There was like dead stop on the ground. But what really got me was like the guy wasn't looking at me while he was no repping me. He was looking at the head judge. And he's just no repping me for the sake of like no repping me. And like the whole thing just seems so weird. And like there's there's been multiple posts and different videos that people have taken different angles. And like they're saying it's a conspiracy, like all these different crazy, crazy, crazy things. Um, but I feel like I was definitely getting like wrongly accused of what was going on. And just the year previously was when I, like I had gotten like you guys, we haven't really hit any of this stuff. But like I had gotten arrested for stealing because I had no money and I was like sleeping on couches of people I didn't know. And I had fucking nothing. Like the only thing I wanted was to go to the CrossFit Games because in my mind, if I went to the CrossFit Games, I would make money. I didn't want to go to the CrossFit Games for the same reason everybody else did. I didn't want to go to the CrossFit Games and be like, I'm the best. I wanted to go to the CrossFit Games because I was like, I'm going to go make money. And then if I can go get my face on that podium, then I'm going to like start my brand. I'm going to do all these things. And I thought that I needed this prerequisite of all of that to be successful later on, which now is like novel not real at all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think a lot of people right now are destroying themselves in the gym because they want to have a big brand in the sport of CrossFit, but they could build a brand now without that. Mm-hmm. We can get into that as well. But like for me, spending so much time building a prerequisite that never was really even needed. It's like me trying to learn how to do fucking calculus. I'm like, I don't even want to be a math teacher anyway. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, it's like two different things. Like business and fitness is two different things. Um and I really believe that like that was something that I wish I would have changed a lot earlier in my life as well. But essentially, when all of that stuff happened, I decided to open the gym because I just felt like that was the next step. It was like the only thing that I knew was fitness. And I was like, I think a gym is really the only thing I can do. And my personal training client at the time was like, hey, I have a space. Do you want to do this? And I actually was like, no. And he's like, well, I thought this is what you wanted. And I was like, I do, but like, I don't want to do it here in California, I don't think. There's too many gyms and I'm terrified. I don't know anything about business. Like I don't know any of this stuff. I, I, I don't know. I make pretty good money as a trainer. I think I, maybe, maybe I'm good, you know? And then he's just like, no, 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 no. We have to do this. And I was just like, ah. like I was like so, so terrified. Uh, and then we wound up saying yes. And then here's the crazy part was like, as soon as we opened the gym, he's like, Ryan, how much money do you have? And I was like, $60,000. And meanwhile, I'm like still stealing stuff at the time because like I thought I had no money because I did had I had no money for such a long time that like I never wanted to get to the point where like I wanted like a million dollars in my account basically to feel like I was okay and I would never be poor ever again. Like I wanted that feeling, you know, so I was almost good that I got in trouble and like got arrested and all these stupid things for doing stupid shit. But eventually, you know, we had that conversation. He's like, how much money do you have? I was at $60,000. He's like, I want you to write me a check for all of it. Because we're investing in this gym and we want to make sure that you're invested in it. And to do that, you need to have no money. And I was like, fuck, I'm going back to zero. I can't believe this is happening. So I went to zero 
I borrowed ten thousand dollars from my mom, which was terrifying because that was like one of the hardest questions I've ever had to do because I never wanted to ask my mom for that money because my sister the year previously had asked her for a bunch of money and she never paid it back, and it like destroyed my mom. And then here I am now. I'm like I have to ask her for money, and it was fucking horrible. But I did it, and I just started paying the money back right away, right away, right away, right away, and everything was like fine. But I'll never forget that moment of just being like, "Fuck, I'm back down to zero. Like this is fucked." That's the insane amount of trust to put in someone. But why? <laughs> why did you go in with him? You believe in his? Was it his vision at this point, or was it was it yours? He made MySpace. Uh, he was a really big business dude, so he built the whole operating system for it, and it was worth millions and millions of dollars. And um, he just like felt like a good mentor. Mm. And I had had several people offer me really cool scenarios. Like if you open this gym, we'll give you this percent. Like we'll put all this money in and do this. Like you, you get all these deals every once in a while. People start believing in you and seeing that you're the kind of person that they want to be partnered in something. I'm sure you've had moments like that. Mm. And when you get in these things, you basically start to have to start weighing options. You know, you're just like, all right, well, what's a better deal? Obviously, like you need any deal to start becoming successful because you have nothing. But there's still better deals than others. And then with him, it was like, we're going to put all this money in. We're going to take your 60K. You're going to have 70% of the business. And then we're going to have 30. I was like, that's not like a good, that's a, that's the best deal I've heard. Like I haven't had anything better than 50% this whole time. Mm. So I was like, okay, this is a great deal. The guy seems super nice. Um, and to this day, <laughs> you want to see how fucking dope this guy is. When Chalk Online took off, I was like, hey, man, like, how do you want me to, like, start paying you for, like, the chalk online? Like, how do you, like, want to go about this and blah, blah, blah? And he's like, nah, you can have it. I want you to make your own money. And he's like, I, I had these opportunities when I was young, and I just want you to have yours. And I was like, fuck. Fuck yeah. So, you know, started making a whole bunch of money. And I was like, dude, are you sure? And he's, and he's just like, dude, he's like, I'm happy for you. Like, he genuinely was happy for me. Like, I started making, like, millions of dollars. And he's just like, you're, you should just, just keep it. And I was like, fuck. So is, is this the first iteration of the Chalk Gym, where, where it's situated now in Newport? Yeah. Fine. So you two go in, in on this gym, and he's literally just doing it as a almost like a favor to you to give you a helping hand, getting you to put some skin in the game, teaching you a little bit about business. Yep. And you open the space. You've been a successful tr personal trainer at, uh, up until this point as well, right? Yep. So cool. the, the reason he picked me over, I was in another gym training with other people. Mm. So there's other trainers listening to this podcast right now. There's other people that are in their beginning part of their fitness journey right now. I didn't own that gym. I didn't have any stake in that gym. There was no part of that gym doing better where I would get a percentage, nothing. But I would stay after with clients whenever they have questions. I would I would personally take offense, actually, if anyone ever said that my class was okay. No. I would personally take offense, actually, if anyone said that they preferred another coach over me. This was a personal thing for me because I was like, if this is what I'm going to do, if I'm going to work at McDonald's, I'm going to be the best person at McDonald's. If I'm going to mm. work in the gym, I want to be the best trainer here. I wanted to have the best warm-ups. I wanted to have the best fucking everything. And it was just something I always had in the back of my head. And thank fucking God that I had that because I got that opportunity and not another coach. It's like, that's why that shit's so important to me. When did it When did it change from being like, because it sounds like, you know, I, I don't know too much about bobsleigh, but sounds like it's quite an individual, like it's, you're an individual in that sport, right? You're an individual uh, and you're training and then, and then, and then your team. And then you're a team out. of four. And then you, and same with CrossFit, like you train a lot on your own, but you're kind of part of this community. Like a lot of it kind of is for yourself. And it sounds as though like your route in was a lot kind of like for your own kind of financial freedom later down the line, like you were doing it for you. When did that, this kind of like transition into coaching? Obviously you wanted to be the best coach, but you need to have a natural kind of like inclination for people to experience their own training journey and get something from itself. Like coaching is very much about like the other person, right? Imparting everything that you can do so they can live a better life. Like when did, when did that happen? Cause it sounds as though now, like again, with your, with your chalk family, you seriously want the best for all those people. Yeah. That's quite a different distinction from, from maybe your, your kind of days as a CrossFit athlete or would, or has it always kind of been in there inside you? Just didn't. I think when I was a trainer, I genuinely thought that that was it. I didn't think I was ever going to be a gym owner or anything more than that. And even where I'm at now, I don't think, I mean, I know that it's possible for me to do other things, but I don't really want to do anything else. I kind of just like what I do. Mm. So I think like once you're happy with where you're at, it's so much easier to give to other people. I feel like we all, everyone right now is like searching for like this selfish energy that you need, but it's so fucked because it's actually the opposite. Like the, the more unselfish you are, the more that the universe gives back to you. Mm. 
So you can become selfish because you think you need to be selfish to get to the next level. And I think that we do. Like, I think that like we need to say no to a lot of things and we need to, you know, maybe have these relationships that we have throughout our lives as young men and stuff like that. Like where you say no to the girl because you have to work on your business and all the different things. But there's a lot that happened. Like, what if you actually just treated the girl differently? Maybe she would treat you differently and you get a lot more freedom and flexibility and all these things. And what if you teach other people, gave them more flexibility, different things like the way that you guys are at March on with all of your people, like you can see it and feel it. Mm. Like I can tell, I can feel what you give to everyone there just walking in the door. Mm. Um, and I don't know. I feel like there's the reciprocity role is just like very, very real. Yeah. So you opened chalk gym. Um, I mean, you've gone on to build one of the biggest online fitness brands in, in the world, right? Off this kind of this, this first brick and mortar facility in Newport. So brand is clearly something that's very important to you. Um, and it is something that's like, it's very much like story driven and it takes time to build a, a great brand like yours. Mm -hmm. But at what stage did it go from being, I want to have this gym to like, I want to build a brand. Um, did you work with brands during your CrossFit career? You referenced how athletes now are all about working with brands, but had you worked with brands and seen how to do certain things with the brands that you looked up to? Like, how did that kind of, that change of going from, I'm going to have this gym to now I want to try and build a brand? It's shit so funny because I don't know. I never knew anything about anything. Mm. Like I always just like felt stuff. So like I remember when I had the gym, interestingly enough, like it was just like, I don't ever want the word CrossFit on my sign. I never had it on the sign. It never was on a business card. It was never on anything. It was just chalk all the time. And everyone was like, why are you doing that? And, I, and I, they're like, you still pay for the affiliation. I'm like, yeah, I do. But like, what if chalk doesn't work out one day? Like, and they're like, well, what do you mean? Like you're starting a CrossFit gym. I'm like, yeah, but like, what if I just want to be chalk one day? And like, what are you going to do with it? I was like, I don't know, but what if, what if, what if, what if I just want it? Mm. So I just never did it. Um, and then a lot of other people, interestingly enough, started doing the same thing. They would open some other gym and it would just be like, like March on, but like without mm. the CrossFit or whatever the name is. And then from there, it kind of just turned into, <laughs> interestingly enough, I actually started the online brand because of a, a client who would drop in all the time. She would just like travel around the world for work. And like, it was her third time dropping in. She's like, Ryan, I love your workouts. You should put them online. And I was like, no. <laughs> and, she's, and she's like, why not? And I'm like, you can get online workouts for free all over the place. Who, and at the time, every CrossFit gym would put the workout of the day on the mm -hmm. website. So it was like, nobody, you'd never go to someone's website. It'd be like, workout of the day, paid. You know, mm -hmm. and just be like, workout of the day. And I'm like, so you want me to turn that into payment? And then she's just like, yes. And I'm just like, huh. I'm like, I just like, I, I, uh. like, it was just like such a hard conversation. And then she's like, listen, I'm going to start a Facebook group for you and start you know, your little community. This lady started it to this day. I cannot delete my Facebook group if I wanted to. She has to delete it. Is she the second person in the three people that have? No, she's not. She's not even one of them. No. She, fuck, he needs to add to the list, bro. She yeah. sounds like she's been quite influential. <laughs> she is influential. Maybe there's a fourth pillar there. Um, but either, yeah, you know what? Let's throw her in. Maybe there's four people. But for her, she started this Facebook group. Dude, the story gets fucking crazy. She winds up being, now she's like the person, she was a regular person when mm. this happened. A normal person didn't want, didn't know what she wanted to do with her life. Nothing. Now she's the second person down from Donald Trump. She's like in government and like all these things. I can't even talk to her anymore. <laughs> like, dude, it's crazy. And she owns your Facebook group. Yes. Her name is Marjorie Green. If you look her up, she is huge with like the whole Republican party. Like it's wild, but I feel like I'm, it sounds like I'm making it up. It's so ridiculous, but either way, she starts the Facebook group, tells me to start the online plan. I go on the, I tell my developer, I'm like, yo, when someone says, look at the workout, I want you, as soon as they click it, I want it to turn around and give them a, uh, like a sad face and say, you got to pay. And then I thought it'd be funny. And then I remember the very first week I launched the online program, I made $4,000 and I was like, fuck. I was like, I, I was paying myself $4,000 in the gym. It was a very unique number because like I was making exactly $4,000 a month and I made exactly $4,000 my first week. And I was like, this is the future because like, why would I do all of this when I could just do this? What year was that? <sighs> I really don't know. Who were, who were the customers? I really don't know. But like genuinely, I would get calls from people in like Norway. I remember there's a guy from Norway who called the gym to ask him what the workout was for the day because he saw it on a story or like on a post or something. I don't think stories even existed yet, but I saw it like on a post and he had like seen a bunch of the workouts. He's like, I really like the workouts. I just like want to know what it is today in the gym. So he didn't like want to pay or anything. He just like wanted to know what today's workout was because he followed chalk and just like wanted to do the workout. And I was like, 
there's something to this thing. I was like, I can get people from all over the world or I can open more gyms. I'm just going to go with this one. And I didn't know anything about brand or anything. I just was like, I want a cool logo and, and that. And I, I still like, I didn't, I never built like a mission or core values or nothing. I just was like, I have really good workouts and I'm going to post them. Mm. But here's the interesting part. Talk about the prerequisite to success and the way that your mind is around everything. I think a lot of things that happen in our life are uh, barricaded by a mindset that's not really true. And it's, it's a belief that we all have. Like we all believe a certain thing. And then you meet someone who's gone beyond that belief. Mm. And then now you have a new belief only because you met the person. Yeah. But if you didn't meet the person, you'd still have the old belief. So the belief that I had at the time was I couldn't sell programs on a large scale because I didn't go to the CrossFit Games. I didn't win. So I was like, all right, well, that's my belief. So $4,000, great, awesome. I feel amazing, but I'm not confident enough to still like tell other people they should follow it, genuinely. So it built to about $40,000 a month. So keep in mind at the time, I had my membership was $20 a month. So what is that? Like 2,000 people? 2,000? Mm. So... 2,000 people signed up before I said anything really about it. I said that, that I was launching it. It was like very, very hush-hush. Did you have a big social media following? It wasn't huge, like 80,000 people. And I had 10,000 before I threatened to murder the judge. And after the judge, I had 80. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my first push. And then I remember I went from that 4,000 all the way to $40,000 a month in revenue every month. No ads, no nothing, just like other people tagging other people. And I was like, holy shit, like, this is wild. I was like, I think I believe in myself enough to talk about this. But I remember being in competitions and stuff still. And people would be like, oh, that's that guy, Ryan. He's like selling eBooks. And like, who is he? You know, like, I remember like feeling that way, like low. And I was like, oh, well, because they, they also thought that to get the, the um, credibility to, to be able to sell those sort of things, you needed to be a great athlete too. And that you hadn't made, you hadn't. No, I think games. they were jealous because they're like, because why they is he doing that? The, okay, they didn't understand I'm, the concept. I am better than him. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Why is he doing that? Mm. And I remember when I started making a lot of money, some of the big CrossFit Games athletes would 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 message me on Instagram and be like, "Hey, bro, I, can I like can I like talk to you about like some of the stuff that you're doing?" And I'd be like, "No, you're you were a dick my whole career. Go fuck yourself." Like I would I would write stuff like that back to them actually, and then there would be like the one or two people who were super cool, and I'd be like, "Dude, I'd love to talk to you. Like you're fucking super cool. Like you." always been nice to me, whatever. Mm. Um, yeah, it was a very, very interesting time because to, dude, I'm sure you know how, what it's like, like how uncomfortable it is to sell to the camera mm. is a learned skill. Mm. It is a learned skill. So like anyone tomorrow, like anyone right now listening is like, dude, I, I want to be an online trainer so bad. I want to sell my programs and all this stuff. And you might be so confident in making programs, so confident in filming your workouts, so confident in taking your shirt off. And like all these things. And then all of a sudden it's like, can you tell the camera that you have a deal going on for $29, $29 this month or whatever? And it's like, uh, and tips. you can't, you can't talk. And it, you know, and then you have to, you have to think about the things that are the beliefs on the person who's receiving the information because mm. that person needs your program and you need to understand that like, it is not in their best interest to not buy it. Mm. Like you're giving them something that's going to improve their life. It's not like, hey, do you want to buy this program because this is my thing and it's really, really good? No, 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 no. You, you need this program because your life is not as good as when you will have it. So that when you do have it, I know your life's going to be better. So I need to, with conviction, tell you that you need this program. And that takes time to be able to talk like that. Mm. And like, it's just, it's a, it's a learning skill. So is that, so that's sort of 40, 40K a month, Mark, is that the, the, the inflection point of when you sort of took on this online online coach, online presence with, with Chalk. When does the accelerant of number two, when does, when do they come in here? Or? I was, my podcast was very big at the time. I had like top five podcasts in the world for health and fitness. Uh, I was That's where out. I first came across you actually, yeah. was, was the podcast. We, we spoke about it a little bit earlier. Um, so actually on that, yeah, you referenced the skill of being able to talk to, to the camera. You've you done a lot of personal brand stuff, getting yourself out there, podcast. Were you YouTubing back then as well? I had like, I would do like one or two here or there. They were ex- like, for me to do a YouTube was really expensive. It was too much money for me to, to really yeah. hang on to. So what, like, what was your intentions around doing that stuff? Just to get your voice heard, get your face in different places? Or did you feel as though you were giving, giving something to the world? Like I said earlier, it was like, to me, social media was my family. I just like wanted to build a bigger family. Sick. So like, yeah. to me, like I look at followers as like bigger family, mm. not like more people I can sell to. Like I'm cooler than someone else. Like to this day. Like I went up a thousand followers saying, I was like, dude, my family just got bigger. 
Mm. It's fun. Cool. I mean, it's a cool film when you think of it that way. How have you managed to keep the connection with, with a, you got what, 300,000 followers now? Mm. How do you keep the ne- connection so tight to all of those people? When I talk to the camera, I'm talking to every single one of them. Yeah. And then when I have a very select thing going on in my life that's fucked or, you know, something that's probably a little bit too personal or whatever, I'll talk to the 10 people who are listening. And then like, I don't know. I think, I think that's the thing that like you should, you should meet everyone in such a way where they never forget your name. Like when you meet somebody, you should never be like, how was it meeting Ryan? You're like, he was okay. Mm. No, like, no, like what, what will ever happen in your life if no one ever remembers your name? And I, and I don't mean it like in like, you know, like a fucking Mel Gibson in like some war movie type of thing where it's like, yeah, you'll never remember your name. I'm, I'm saying like genuinely, like what is it about you that is special? Because mm. there's a lot of people that are good looking, that can look good with their shirt off, they're good at business, they're good at this, they're good at that. But I don't know, man. Like what is it about you that like makes people just like, I wish Ryan was here. Mm. Mm. <laughs> I wish so-and-so was here. Um, I wish, you know, like I, 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 I don't know. I, I want to like put that fucking special little mark on something. And I feel like it makes a big difference. And uh, it, it 110% has like your authenticity, like to this day has, has been unwavering. I mean, side note, Sam, who sat in the room, he obviously met you out in Newport, big, was a big fan. And then I think he, I might pass that as a story, but he referenced it to you his brother. And then his brother started following you. He's like, I mean, he's into fitness, but like nowhere near like what, what, what we are. He doesn't work in fitness or anything like that. He's like, fuck that. Ryan's got like Labrador energy. <laughs> or, or golden retriever, so golden retriever, like golden retriever energy. Like every time he's, every time he's on social media, like that, that like bouncy, like golden retriever yeah. dog energy just comes across. And I, so, so I think every, like everything you're saying, like it's, it's not like you're not just keeping up appearances when you when you're going online. Like you are genuinely connected and passionate about the things you're talking about, who you're talking to, and making sure that your message is heard. Um, remember, is, remember when you came to Newport? How excited I was to show you everyone. Yeah, fuck yeah. Do you know how many times I've done like all that shit? But it would seem yeah, like the first time. It, well, it's, it's probably that, like, we, we've kind of gone off on a tangent here, but it's probably the reason why I've ke- I, I personally have felt to keep in touch. Like, yesterday I met you in London. I was working um, in White City, one of one of our gyms there. And, like, I had a busy day. It was a full-on full yeah, day. Yeah, it's probably like, your worst day. I, 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 I have to go and see Ryan. And, like, for <laughs> most people, I'm like, do you know what? Like, it's cool. I've met him once. Like, we connected. We we shot some content. And, like, like we can speak on Instagram. But, like, if, with you, it's just different because the hospitality you showed when we, we were in Newport was, like, was on another level. The energy to just like make the extra bit of effort, even in Miami. Like we both flew into Waterpalooza. We were both busy, had busy schedules, but we met in some ho- hotel lobby and, and connected. And I think that like, if you can bring it on a personal level to people, if you can bring it to social media, if you can bring it to your brand, if you can bring it to your business, if you can show that there's a genuine care and attention to the detail and a passion about what you're doing, it makes the sale so much easier because people are ready to buy without you even giving the call to action. Well, nobody really buys anymore. Even like when it comes to like paid advertising, it's if you make an actual ad, it doesn't do very well anymore. Mm. Like nobody likes that stuff. Everybody wants to, f- everybody, the younger generation is that they don't really want to go to college anymore. They don't really have like friends anymore. Like I think um, they, they had this study recently where essentially the amount of rejection that men are getting through dating apps now is astronomical because like the woman has the ability to see every single man. You know, like, you, you, know, you used to know like 20, mm-hmm. you know, like your small kind of group, you know, like I remember going back in like a high school, I used to, have to fucking ring the phone and talk to the dad and be like, is your, is Shannon home? You know, fucking terrifying. Now you're literally on the app and you're just like, no, 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 no. And then for like every thousand, you know, swipes the other way, like for a guy, like they're swiping on like every five, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> so there's like mass rejection there. And then I think it's another like, like the no show rate on a date now is actually like super high. So you have these people who are just getting like more and more introverted, more and more introverted, more and more introverted. So instead of being sold to, they want to feel the family vibe. They want to feel mm. the energy. They want to feel the connection. Like there's no connection left. Mm. And then COVID made it even worse. Um, I know we just like took a, a side tangent on, on, on that whole thing, like talk about the dating app and all the different things, but it's just, it just goes to show the framework that's actually creating these men nowadays. It's like, there's no men really left. No. It's, it's, fucking, it's, really not. it's fucking soft. Um, getting us back on track. I want to hear about number two. So who's, who's the second person that was the, the big influence on your life? So back to the podcast. Yeah. Podcast is really big. Someone tells me, you know what? Uh, I have this, this friend that you should go meet. He lives in Texas and he owns this thing called Gym Launch. His name is Alex Ramosi. Mm-hmm. And you who's should, that? You should just send him a message. Never and, heard of her. 
You should send a message to see if he wants to be on your podcast. I look him up. It's got like 8,000 followers. I, dude, after this, I will show you the text message, our first text message, because I still have it in my, in my thing. And actually, it was his birthday uh, last month. And for his birthday, I sent him our first text message. <laughs> I thought that was pretty awesome. Like, like, what did you, you send the guy who's got everything in the world? Literally, right? And our first couple of messages are all time hilarious. Like, yeah. So I'm like, hey, dude, do you want to be on, on my podcast? This guy tell me blah, blah, blah. And he's like, yeah, sure. When do you want to do it? I was like, oh, I'm kind of a spontaneous person. Like, I'll come tomorrow if you're down. And he's like, where do you live? I was like, California. He's like, really bold. <laughs> he's like, I am free tomorrow if you really want to come. I literally was like, okay, I'll buy my flight right now. And he's like, seriously? I was like, yep. And then I literally bought my flight, showed, screenshot it to him. And he's like, I guess I'll see you tomorrow. And I was like, yeah. So then I think that we're going to go to like a WeWork or something like that. Guy gives me the address to his house. Actual address to his house. So that would never happen now. Mm. But anyway, I show up to his house and I'm like, wow, this is fucking super nice house. Like, I'm like, I saw this guy like owns this gym brand and like he's got this mustache and he's jacked and like, I don't know, he just looks very, very interesting. But I never imagined like how much money this guy was making. Like I had never met anyone like this. I literally got to the point where like I ring the doorbell, he answers the door. I come in, he's super nice. We're like connected right away. Start hanging out. He's like, do you want to work out? So we start working out in the gym. As we're working out in the gym, we're just like talking about business and all this stuff. And then we come out and we like, eat lunch. Layla comes out. I meet Layla. And then, you know, we just start chatting and chatting and chatting. We're supposed to podcast. Didn't podcast. He's like, why go out to dinner? I'm like, yeah, we go out to dinner. And then he starts telling me about all this business stuff and blah, blah, blah. Meanwhile, at the time, I think I'm making like 50 or 60 grand a month on the app. Like to me, I'm exponentially wealthy in my mind. I'm Mm -hmm. like, this is crazy, insane money. That's like, no, like no one makes this much money in my head. I genuinely, I didn't, cause I didn't have any, I didn't have any business friends. Like, you know, like my next closest friend made seven grand a month and I'm making 50. I literally was just like, what's the point of even making more? Like I like in my mind, I'm like, I make so much money. I don't even need to make more money. Like meanwhile, there's so much more money to be made, but I'll never forget to the point where like, I can live it in my mind as I speak it right now. He, I remember him just being like, how much money are you making? I was like, like 50 grand a month. He's like, it's good. <laughs> just like, <laughs> like it was nothing. And then, but I didn't like truly understand because I was like, well, how much money do you make? And then, and then uh, like, well, he was like going into different things. He's like, well, I have this one thing that makes like 50 grand a week. And then I have this other thing that makes like 1.2 million, like a week or like, or like all these things. I was like, wait, what? I was like, I literally just like everything, like just life just flying through my head. I'm just like, what is happening right now? I did like, I didn't know any of these things were possible. And then, like, everything I'm doing sucked. Like, he's like, oh, you can just do this and this and this. Oh, you can just do this and this. Why are, why are you even doing that? Blah, 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 blah. Like, all these different things. And I'm literally just like, huh, uh, like, this is unbelievable. So <laughs> I literally had a flight to go back, like, the next morning. And he's like, do I hang out tomorrow? And, yeah, I got to do some things in the morning and then we'll hang out and, and lift and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay. So I wound up hanging out there for, like, three days before we actually podcasted. I'm like changing my flight daily. Like, I don't know what to do, but like, I'm like, this guy's obviously really smart. I have no clue who he is, but like, like it's no question that he wanted being famous on social media. Because like when I was just talking to him in person, like anything that he said, you were just like, like what? Like he just knew so much about it. Um. So yeah, that just like, the reason he was the pillar, he never like told me anything to this day really that was like, that changed my business forever. Still to this day, like we're like, you know, we're really good friends, but it was just the belief of what was possible. That was all I needed. Mm. I remember like literally within two months from that, I went from 50 grand a month to six figures a month and never looked back. What did you do differently though? Um, fuck at the actual time. I think I got into like paid ads at the time. I, I got very strongly convicted in my product to, to the point where like selling was second nature mm. because before then I wasn't very good at selling. I didn't really like know what a good ad looked like. I didn't really know anything like just freestyling everything, you know, like maybe how you feel out here in England, like in a place where like no one's really doing what you're doing, unless you're meeting people like me who are coming by, Mm. you don't really have anyone to talk to and like bounce the idea off of like, we we might do this thing and it might work, but like, I don't have anybody that I could ask to see if it's actually going to work. Yeah. You know, it's like, I always felt like that. It's like, I'm just doing this and then it's doing well. So I'm just gonna keep doing that. But like, I didn't actually know what did best. 
And he would say what does best. And then he'd say, look at this person. Look at this person. I'd start looking at people. It's so fucking ridiculous to me now that I'm like, oh, I want it to be this big brand, but I never looked at what other bigger brands were doing. Like, who the fuck does that? I'm like, I was doing that every day of my life. I was like, I wasn't looking at the bigger brand. I just was like, how do I make more money? Mm. Like, it's just like so, it's so ridiculous. What year was that? Ah, oh, fuck. Three, four years ago. Maybe three. Maybe three. I mean. Because he's grown now. He went from like eight. To yeah. Now he's like two million or whatever. Imagine like your first proper like realization of business is like three days with Hormozy. Yeah. Well, I don't need to, well, I need to imagine it. You, you had that. I mean, that's. It's actually not fun to hang out with him now because <laughs> I'm just, no, I'm dead serious. Like, because no matter how content you are, he just ruins it. <laughs> Cause you're like, Oh, I've like do X. And it's just like, Oh, that's good. Like every <laughs> single time I'm just like, fuck. Mm. So because you can be content in the moment. You're like, I'm really happy with where I'm at. Like I'm making X amount of dollars. Like, I mean, obviously there's more money to be made. I understand that now, but at the same time, it's like, I'm happy. But then you become unhappy because you know, he doesn't make you feel like what you were doing is not significant enough. He makes you feel like you're not at your full potential. Mm. And that is what's tough. Mm. Because his potential is so high. Like he's on the billions of dollars worth of potential that like you're not at that point yet. But you know that like you could be if you just like were on that level and if you wanted to be at that level. But what it takes to get there is a very different person. I, dude, I fight with it daily. Like every day of my life is like, do I want to be this person? Or do I want to be this person? Do I want to go live in Bali for the rest of my life and never worry about money ever again? Or do I want to buy a $20 million house in Newport Beach and show everyone that, like, I'm the fucking man? You know, mm-hmm. like, like I would, I, I've personally never been like that. Like, I'm totally fine with my house I have now, which is, it's a nice place. But, like, yeah, you, you toy with these ideas. And I think a lot of people get to this point, too, where it's, like, the bigger your company gets, the more people you manage, the more money you make, all these things. Like, is this good or is this better? And then you see someone who's, like, traveling all over the place and you're like that looks really fun mm. but then you see someone who has like an office and stuff and you're like man that looks really like structured and nice uh and it's just like these these games you play with your head we should like switch places for a month and see whether we actually like the other person's Dude, life funny enough there's like that what is that movie where they actually do that and it's in england uh do you know what it is the holiday oh yeah yeah, holiday. yeah, yeah. yeah we could do totally do holiday <laughs> <laughs> um all right, so let's touch on the on the on who is person number three, and then I want to come on to onto training because your training now looks very different from from CrossFit days. Um, so who who is person number three? I mean, first the first two sound amazing. The per- first person is the one of the founders of MySpace, gives you an incredible deal. The second person is <laughs> is Hormozy, who is yeah. he's an absolute G. Um, so who's number three? Three is my paid ads person. Sick. Totally. Um, How did you meet them? Her name is Virginia, mm. and I met her from a podcast. So I interviewed. Fuck, a, we should do more of this podcast thing, man. Oh, dude, the podcast is it's it's the fact that I ever stopped is actually embarrassing. Like I should get if again I don't have tattoos, I would have chalk everywhere, and I'd have embarrassing somewhere to, <laughs> to remember myself in all the dumb, stupid shit that I've done. So that would probably have to be like it have to be in a very visible, like really on the neck here, just like you're fucking stupid. Uh, so anyway, the um I had this podcast with this woman. She worked at Barry's boot camp. Which is a, do you know what that is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. speaking. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's big. Oh, yeah, actually, yeah. it's here too. So she was making like $200 a class, like really high up trainer, was making a bunch. She was like making good money as a trainer. And then she told me that she went all in online. And I was like, I had to have a podcast with her because I was like, what are you, what are you doing? You know? Mm-hmm. And this is around the same time that I met Alex, by the way. So it's not after, it's not like before, it's like right around like the same time. So my two pillars like happened at the same time. And she was telling me how she started doing like, you know, thirty, forty thousand dollars a month on all of her online training stuff. And, you know, she just started coaching less classes, less classes that eventually just went all online. And I'm thinking to myself at the time, because I, I I don't think I was there yet, monetarily speaking. And I because I remember these numbers being very, very impressive to me. And I was like, holy fuck. And then she told me about this person that was running ads and all this stuff. And then when, as soon as the podcast was over, I was like, hey, do you mind if I use I reach out to this person and you connect to me, whatever. She sells like pregnancy programs. I was like, I'm not, you know, I'm no competition for you, nothing. Uh, but she's like, yeah, sure. And the girl worked at like a big agency in Canada. And, you know, she was doing this thing on the side for my friend. And then she started doing this thing on the side for me. And then I mean, everything I did went times 10. So like 
you know, I was making like three or four thousand dollars on ebooks at the time, like no app, and it went to like thirty, forty thousand dollars a month with just like ebooks and like all these different things. And I was like, holy fuck, this is crazy. Like, like all these things were happening, like going crazy, crazy, crazy. And then um I think we started pushing it towards the app, started like building different things out, started like learning about landing pages, or like learning about all the different things. She basically taught me everything I needed to do with like all of these things. And then I met Alex. I definitely met Alex after that. And then Alex was like, you should read these books. And it was like uh, Russell Brunson's ClickFunnels, mm. .com secrets, expert secrets, all the, all the things. Um, for those of you out there who've never read anything about building funnels and building your business and all that stuff, it's a great place to start. Um, his name is Russell Brunson. You, the whole, just, you'll see all of his books. So you read all of those and then you start, you know, your mind is just racing. You start like thinking about all these different things that you can do and all the things that you're not doing. And then you think about the opportunity cost. I think that is the biggest thing that, will ruin a person's mind is the opportunity cost that you're missing out on. So one of the most profound things that I'll ever remember, and I think you were actually there in Orlando Mm -hmm. when Alex asked someone in the crowd, he said, how much money do you make a year? He said a hundred thousand dollars. And he said, it's costing you $900,000 every single year to not know how to make a million dollars. Ignorance tax. So how much money is the $20,000 business coach or the 10 or whatever, however much money your gym owner network thing is Mm -hmm. or whatever it is. It's like, it doesn't matter how much it costs <laughs> mm-hmm. because it's it's the it's the little arrow in the Mario game that gives you the 10x speed. Mm. And you, you got to go over that if you want to get to the next level. And yes, you can figure out how to do it on your own. And yes, you can get free workouts online. And yes, you could get a lot of free shit. But how long is it going to take you to get to the point where it's perfect? Like how long is it going to take you to build March on versus how long it would take you to build March on now? Mm. <laughs> so it's like. If someone could tell you how to build March on the way it was supposed to be built right now, wouldn't you just pay that tax versus like it takes you X amount of years to get it to where it is now? It's like there's the thing that sucks is there's too many people who are trying to make a quick buck who will ruin that experience for you. So like maybe nine out of 10 coaches do suck, but there is that one who can give you all the good stuff. Mm. But yeah, you might, you know, I mean, Alex always says to me too, like there's no such thing as a bad buy because now it breaks another belief for you. It's like if you pay $20,000 to someone to give you a bunch of shit, it just broke your belief system that whatever you sell for twenty thousand dollars is any better than that. <laughs> so is it is it worth it? So it just keeps going on and on and on. It's like we're all. If if you guys get anything out of this podcast, I want you to understand that whatever you believe it to be true right now is actually not true at all. You just need to meet another person. Mm. And a lot of times it's a podcast. A lot of times it's bumped into somebody on the tube. <laughs> That's definitely something we myself and Jen's took away when we went to Orlando. Is that like. In America, people just think and speak bigger. Like people think way, way bigger. There's no like glass ceilings that they place themselves. Blue sky thinking, bigger and better. Everyone's like, not even just like about numbers, just about like where they want to try and take their lives. It's quite endearing. And it's Mm -hmm. like, it can can sometimes be like too overwhelming if you're in that environment for too much and you don't know how to distill that down to like your own situation. Mm -hmm. But if you can, if you can kind of draw some parallels for where you're at now and where you're trying to get to and how thinking bigger and and breaking down some of the self-limiting beliefs, like it can unlock new levels. Um, is she still your ads person now? Unfortunately, no. No. So she didn't leave the, like, did she leave the agency? Oh, so I actually, I asked her how much money she was making at the agency. And I said, I'll just match that for you. Mm -hmm. If you just quit the agency and you only work for me. Uh, and the one person who, who, uh, referred us for me. So she quit the agency, just worked for us and she did everything for me. And then Alex told me that she didn't have the skill set to get me to the next level. And I needed a different team. And then I was like, I really don't think that's true. (laughs) <laughs> and you know, I got stuck for a while, like making a certain amount. And then I got to the point where it was like, I guess I'm just going to try hiring this other team. Mm-hmm. And the other team was way, way, way more money. Um, and they definitely scaled me more, but I think at the end of the day, there's a lot of things in place that help your paid ad strategy, mm-hmm. like the structure of everything. And like one of the structure is really good. It lowers the cost to acquire a customer. It's not necessarily always the ad or the ad spend or the media buyer or any of these things. So I do wish I kind of kept her. I, I still keep in touch. We talk all the time. Like she's just too, she's too relevant. Like mm. I still send her Christmas presents and birthday presents and her kids and shit like that. Like she's just such a dope person. Um, but yeah, I think in a, in a roundabout way, she was another belief breaking system. So like once I saw that like my paid advertisements were like, like I could be a face that people could trust and want to purchase from. I mean, imagine thinking about yourself. Imagine being a trainer right now listening to this podcast and you don't make a lot of money or anything. You don't feel like anybody knows you. And then you're online in front of tens of thousands of people or millions of people and they're buying your thing. It's a very interesting phase of life to go through. Mm. It's like, wow, I'm actually like influential. Mm. Like fuck the word influencer. That's like, that's 
that doesn't mean the same thing as like, I'm actually like making a difference to other people's lives. And, and it's, I'm, I'm a valuable resource. Like actually not like to look at and laugh or like look at and be like, Oh, she's super hot or like whatever it is that makes an influencer an influencer. But like genuinely, like people are like, their hard earned money is going towards my product and it's benefiting them and they're tagging it and talking about it. And like, fuck, it's just like a really cool thing. Was there a time where you, like you saw it happen and you recognized it? Or do you think it was just like deliberate action of showing up every day and you referenced trying to be the best at everything you did? Like, okay, now I'm going to do this online thing. I'm just going to try and be the best online guy. Now I'm going to talk to the camera. I'm going to try and make myself better at talking to the camera day after day after day. And now I'm going to write a workout. I'm just going to try and make that workout better. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure it was the, the latter, like that that was what you were doing and then eventually you became influential. Because I think a lot of people now, you know, kind of ask me like, how, how do you build brand? I'm like, well, stop thinking about how to build it and just start just doing stuff, putting stuff out there, being really authentic, being consistent, showing up every day. Was there was there a point in which you like, you made a conscious decision to change something or was it just those daily habits and things that you were doing that, that kind of got you there? It was the people. Like I, I needed, I needed to see someone doing something way, way better than me so to know that I can get there. Yeah. For some reason, and what, did you adopt some of their behaviors or just know that they were there out there doing bigger things? I didn't even know what they were doing. Just like knowing Alex made more money than me, just knowing mm. that, you know, paid ads would work, just knowing that launching an online program, people would buy it. Like just knowing that these things were real and actual thing just changed everything for me. Yeah. Dude, I didn't actually read a book really, genuinely. I never really, really read a book until I met Alex and he told me to read those, those three books, like Dot Com Secrets, Expert Secrets, and one of the other ones, whatever mm. the other one was. That was like the first like books I started reading. And then even now, like now I'm like obsessed with reading books though. But before that, like every single thing up to that point to like making like 40, 50 grand a month was like just fucking winging it. <laughs> like no fucking clue what I was doing. Um, and I think the biggest thing, man, it's so hard when you don't make anything and you're trying to figure your life out, which is like so many people. I'm still trying to figure my life out. I'm 37 years old. That is never going to go away. You are never going to figure your fucking life out because you're always going to think, if there's a better version of it, you're always going to think that there's, you know, some version of it that like you think is true. Another fucking belief you need to get over. But like, we're all just like living in the moment. And I think a lot of the people that you aspire to be like, don't know what the fuck they're doing either. Like everyone is just kind of winging it. And then we like find this little groove and we ride it. And then the groove goes away and you got to find a new groove. And like all these things just kind of keep happening. And I think for some reason, everybody thinks that they need to like have it all figured out. And it's like, when you think you have it all figured out, that's like when you're going to be in a plateau and like things are not going to get any better. Like you should always be in a moment of chaos in some, some mm. shape or form. Like I'm the person, I don't have a flight home yet. Well, I was going to say, I was gonna say that. Like, you, you certainly like the, the story you've told around those kind of three situations you've been in. And also like, even when I speak to you, I'm like, oh, you should come to London. You're like, yeah, you say when and I'll be there. Yeah. Like you, you are quite free, free spirited and kind of open to the idea of just like, finding the groove and riding away for a period of time until we, like, you're on the next vibe. Mm. I yeah. mean, I think it's very difficult for a lot of people in this day and age because there's a lot of things that are out there that kind of dictate the way we should act and should behave and should do this and we should follow this path and do those things at certain times. So for a lot of people to be quite free and open to the idea of travel and, and just like riding each kind of wave is, is quite difficult, particularly with like the the kind of hustle culture and stuff that, that like, people are set on, on social media and also the the fact that like people trying to work in, in a decade, like delaying that gratification, something Hormozzi talks about a lot, like you've been working at this now a long time, I've been working at this a long time. For people that are starting out now to think in five or 10 years time probably seems like, fuck, fuck that. I'm not, I'm not going to think that far away. But here's the thing. Everything that I've always thought in my lifetime that I thought was perfect when I launched it, I'm like this is fucking perfect. Mm. Shit the bed. And then everything that I was like, this is not ready yet. This is not good. I don't like this. I don't like this. Kills it. And you and I talked about this the other day about like landing pages for our brand and mm. stuff like that. And how I was just like, that shitty one did really well. And like a really good one didn't do as well. It's the same thing, like, you know, talking to that trainer right now who's listening to this and you don't have anything and you're kind of like trying to figure yourself out. Um, it's like, you have to start and fuck your shit up just so you know what to fix. Because mm. like you think that you need to make this program for CrossFitters, for example, when in reality, everybody who follows you wants to get in shape. So they don't care about CrossFit. They care about your dumbbell program. They mm. care about this. They care about that. But launch your fucking CrossFit program because when no one buys it, you're you'll right. know it was a dumbbell program. Yeah. Do you know yeah. what I'm saying? So it's like you're going to wait to have like the perfect ebook and like all this different shit and the perfect checkout and all this stuff, but nobody wants a fucking CrossFit workout anyway. So you have to launch so that you know what to fix. So it's like 
I think a lot of people get this wrong because they keep hearing it. They're like, oh, I have to fail. I have to fail. I have to fail. But nobody wants to fail. No one's going to try to go out and fail like because nobody wants to do that. Nobody can afford to do that. Like that is the worst advice for someone who's successful to go tell someone to go fail. Because it's mm-hmm. like the motherfucker's already failing. You can't tell him to go fail worse or like go fuck his life up worse. Like you have to tell him why it's so important. And no one ever says that. It's like you have to go fuck your shit up so that you understand just like what you just like have to understand like what direction to go in. And you mm-hmm. don't really know because we're all floating along mm-hmm. and we're all trying to figure out what's going to work best. Um, and I think it's so it's so fucking interesting because for me, I think, dude, I fucking I must have made a half a million to a million dollars on dumbbell books and kettlebell books. It was mental. I was like, this is what people want. Mm. Nobody cares about the CrossFit stuff. Meanwhile, I'm doing fucking, I don't know, Murph in like 40 minutes with a vest on and all these different things, snatching 300 pounds and all these different things. That's what I thought everybody wanted. And then I realized it wasn't. And then even now, like everyone's like, Ryan Fisher, the CrossFit guy. Nope. Ryan Fisher's cross. Ryan Fisher's Chalk app is 75% of people who want to go to the gym and look good and feel good. Mm. And 70, 74% is my full body bodybuilding program. And 8% eight is CrossFit. Yeah. And if I didn't have the metrics, if I didn't fail a whole bunch, I would never know. And you'd still be trying to push CrossFit. I would still be trying to push fucking CrossFit. So people, go fuck your shit up so you this, fix it. This is a nice segue to just to kind of wrap up on, on kind of training. I think just your beliefs around training. You're someone at 37 years old. You're in incredible shape. You've kept yourself in great shape. You place a lot of emphasis on your nutrition. Um, fairly min- minimalist, it's probably fair to say, like like from the day-to-day perspective. But you, you obviously like like to eat out in nice places. You live a nice lifestyle. Um what is like? What does training look like for you? And I think if you if you were to build, actually, you reference you were winging it up to forty thousand pounds. I think yeah. what you were doing very well was you write really cool programs, um, which I think is born out of just like your passion for training and, and, and fitness, and you just learn by doing workouts, right? So, what does training look like for you? And if you were to sort of impart some knowledge on on the listeners that are general fitness consumers, of which a lot of them would be, uh, what are the sort of key things that you, you think about when you're writing workouts or you have a training phase? Dude, so even when I did CrossFit, I was like, I don't want, I don't want my programs to look like CrossFit. Because mm. I want to be just the way this same reason I want to be the person that you don't forget. I want the workouts to be the same way to the point where people literally will tag me. And other people. people will tag me and be like, that's a Ryan Fisher workout. Like, mm. like, how is that possible? How can there be CrossFit and then interval workouts, like infinite of them, but someone still knows it's mine? So for me. So what I, is synonymous with a Ryan Fisher workout? So I think, I think like the, the bottom part of the pillar, the most important part. I think is the fact that I am responsible for your body when you go into the world. So I think of that. Like that is my main thing. I'm like, if you go out into the world, people want to ask where you work out, why you're so fit, all of these things. If that's my main pillar, am I going to give you a handstand push up and a snatch? Like there's certain movements are just gone, right? Like mm-hmm. high scale gone, but I love the CrossFit methodology and I was a CrossFit athlete. And like, I, I didn't want to like not give my people CrossFit. I didn't even know I was going to make money. I didn't know, I didn't know any of these things, but in my mind, I'm like taking, I'm chunking things down, trying to figure out like what is going to give me the best version of a human that people will see. So that they ask about me. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, take out the scale, give them the cardio. Cause that part's fun. And then give them the lifting parts that are going to be like essential to the point where it's giving them a lot of training volume over a lot of body parts, AKA compound movements. Mm-hmm. So it's like mix these things together. And then make sure that you're doing it in such a way where like people like don't slow down. So like a lot of times for me, like a big AMRAP will be like 20 minute AMRAP of like two of this, four of this, six of this, eight of this, like really Mm. small, easy numbers so people don't stop moving. Mm. And then when it comes to bodybuilding, you know, I was like, you know, I don't think a lot of people ask why enough. Like when we're young, we ask why a lot. But when we get older, we stop asking why. We we, we want people to think that we know like mm-hmm. all the answers. And I think it's okay to know that like you don't know all the fucking answers. Like I'm happy to ask you a question that you might think that I know the answer to. And I'm not embarrassed to ask you that I don't. Mm. <laughs> and it's like, but people get older and they, they're embarrassed to ask. Like they, they want you to believe that they know the answer, but you're really fucking stupid because you don't know the answer and you won't ask. And you'll never learn it. So now you're getting even dumber. <laughs> so <laughs> for me, it's like, I ask, why is a bro split a thing? Why is a push-pull split a thing? And it's like, at the end of the day, it's like, there is total training volume over body parts over a given period of time. How much training have you done from Monday to Sunday? Mm. If that is the case, then why do we have all these body splits? Yes, there's recovery and there's all these different things, 
But at the end of the day, you can really put these things together in like a lot of really interesting ways. So I started creating the full body split. I created different like bodybuilding splits that like I didn't create full body split, but like I created my own version of it. And then I would just create my own versions of other programs based off of the ideologies that people never asked the reason why. So when you saw them, they seemed very different. Mm. And then when they seem very different, it has a novel effect. When it has a novel effect, you want to do it more. You want to tell people about it more. You put yourself into this little community of people and it just becomes, I don't know, like an addictive thing to be part of this thing. Like it's the same reason that people are part of CrossFit. It's the same reason. Blah, blah, blah. It's the same reason they're part of chalk. It's the same reason they're part of march on. Mm. There's something special about it, right? There's some sort of mark that is being left. I'm just always about that mark. I just feel like we want to leave the mark all the time. Um, so I think about things like that, and I'm not necessarily obsessed with like this is going to make you the best bodybuilder in the world or the best athlete in the world. I just want you to look good, feel good, in the minimal amount of time possible. So for my training to go from like what I'm thinking about and then into my training, it took me a really long time to understand that there is a certain amount of training volume that gives people results. And there's also a very certain amount of training volume that gives people maintenance. Mm. So one of the things in my life is like, if I want my business to go up sometimes, or I want to have experiences in my life, or like, dude, sometimes I'd rather go ride my bike than go and go paddleboard and go to the gym. Just because mm. I'm like, it's really nice out. I've been inside working a lot. And in my younger years, I'd be like, nope, have to train have to be jacked, have to like all these things. But like now it's like, I know that I don't have to, like I could train three days a week and I'd still look the same. Mm. And for the last six weeks, two weeks previous to this, so two weeks ago for six weeks previously, I did a three day per week program to prove to myself that I wouldn't change. So I worked out Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and I did it in a very interesting way. I did something called HST training, which is hypertrophy specific training. It's a, it's like an off season program for NFL players fucking cool and you do like every single um compound movement in one session like you're doing deadlifts you're doing squats you're doing bench you're doing all these things and it's the same workout three days a week for six weeks it doesn't change same rep ranges same everything everything well no the rep ranges change the rep ranges change every two weeks so for two weeks you're doing two sets of 15 reps of all these movements and for the next two weeks it's 10 reps of all of them and the last two weeks is five any targeted bicep or tricep or any work like that is all compounds all compounds like a little bit of targeted work but like very little. There's 10 movements each session. There's two targeted movements. Okay. So I'm literally like from one workout, like Monday, Wednesday, Friday, my only goal is to add like five pounds to the bar. Like that's it. And then it just like, just keeps going and going and going and going and going. Dude, I actually wound up looking better at the end of the program than before. Mm. Cause it's like, I wonder, cause I've been training for so long. I wonder if the effort that I'm putting into the workout for the other five to six days a week previously is just not even really there enough to really make yeah. a difference. So like when you get, yeah, I mean, just like it's, it's, Yeah. There's a huge difference between people who want to grow and people who want to maintain. And I think a lot of people, they get to this area where they could maintain very easily and they let it run their lives versus them running their own lives. Like, dude, mm. how many times have you been on vacation? I mean, I, I know that you that you do this and I, I've never asked the question. But like, you feel like you're getting smaller because you're on vacation and you haven't worked <laughs> out. You're like, I got to get to a gym somewhere. Like, yeah. All these different things. It's like, no, you don't really have to. Like science says, like most body parts, you can maintain five sets per week. Mm. It's like one session in the gym. To be honest, the last, the last, I'd say probably three, four months, we spoke about it, myself and Sam, because we were talking about sort of you know, things to film. The last three, four months, like my training volume has been the lowest it's ever been. And there was probably like a year period where I was really trying to fight the, the demand of having three kids and growing businesses and wanting to train five days a week and trying to do jujitsu and all these other things. Like just throwing it all at myself and just like absorbing it and just fucking just deal with it. And I got to a stage where I was like, this is actually really fatiguing. And I, like, I'd been here before in, in previous years where like, I'm going to fall off a cliff if I keep going. Mm -hmm. So training was the one thing because I, I really want to continue with this hobby of jujitsu. I can't get rid of any of my kids now. Um, and, I, and I want my businesses to, to, to continue growing. So training was the one thing that I've like, I say sacrificed. I've certainly gone to a place where I'm feeling as though I like, I'm just getting the minimal viable dose to maintain. And I'm, and it's definitely happened. Like I look the same, I feel the same, everything's the Don't same. Change, in fact, yeah. if anything, I've just got a bit more energy and I'm less tired and sore. Yeah. Um, and I, I suppose it's an age thing more than anything else. And just that the fact that my goals don't require me to be in the gym five days a week for anything more than yeah 45 minutes. But 90% of the people listening to this podcast right now, if you're in good shape, you're already, you're overtraining mm. mm -hmm. because you're, you're in such good shape that the amount of training you need to do to get to the next level is more than you're doing. Yeah. And the amount for you to do the week what you're maintaining is less than you're doing. So like, if you guys ever read a book by Dr. Mike, uh, Dr. Mike Israel from um, RP Strength, he talks about this training volume and how much you actually need and how the majority of people are training, they're doing something called junk volume, mm. which is essentially 
You're just doing more than you need to. Talks about MRV, right? Max volume. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, but like there's maintenance volume too. And there's like, there's your, your normal training zone and like Mm -hmm. all these different things. And you, you really look at it and you're like, I'm really just like wasting a lot of time. But yeah, Mm. like I know mentally you feel good, but like you could just go for a run. Mm. You could just go paddleboard. You could go surfing. Mm. You could go skiing. And like, it's cool. Um, What's next for you, bro? I want 100,000 online members. You're at 24? 25, but just almost 25, 24 something. Why? Is it just a number that you set yourself? Because I, I, to me, I think 10,000 was like obnoxious. I thought that was just so many. And then I, and then 20,000 I thought was insane. And then, I don't know, I just feel like 100,000 just like sounds ridiculous to me. Mm-hmm. I think a million sounds ridiculous too, but like 100,000 seems like a number that's achievable to where it's like so ridiculous to me, but like absolutely possible. And I'm like, that'd be cool. I might get there and still want to go to a bigger number too. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just my only focus. I'm not like, I want to do this. I want to do that. I want to do this. I just want 100,000 online members. Sick. That's my fam. <laughs> I uh, I look forward to watching it happen because I've got no doubt that it will happen. Yeah, um, mate, you are one of the industry's fucking good guys. I think anyone that gets to spend a bit of time with you will, will just like feel your infectious energy. So uh, it was great to connect in Newport. It was great to connect in Miami, um, Orlando, now London. Yeah, I think next time I'll be back over on your side of the pond. Hell yeah! Thank you, brother. I appreciate it.